President Bola Tinubu of Nigeria has signed uh, executive orders to help improve the investment climate and position Nigeria as the preferred investment destination for oil and gas. The incentives include in, well, uh, through the value chain of the oil and gas sector, upstream, midstream, downstream, wants to streamline the contract process to six months, reduce the hindrance of the local content requirements, which are very important. Doesn't want that to inter in interfere with the streamlining of uh, investments coming into the country. And also uh, the incentives are gonna be developed with several ministries involved. We are happy to have Mr. Philip uh, Mshebila, who is the CEO and MD of the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas join, uh, Limited, joining us from our Abuja uh, studios. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I hope I didn't leave anything out. Can you give us an overview of, how, of the executive orders for, the, uh, for your sector? Thank you very much, uh, Rutus, and um, it's uh, good to be here. I think the uh, overview is that the government has taken a look at the industry, has listened to the industry as well, where we have pinch points and difficulties, and has decided to focus on a couple of areas where it can remove bottlenecks and ease the business of the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. Uh, the areas that it's looked at are around the fiscals, it's looked at the contracting cycle, and it's also looked at local content. And so as a result, there have been these three policy directives covering those areas. And each of these has gone into trying to address the specific problems that the industry faces uh, to make this easier for, uh, for us to conduct business within the industry and also to attract investment, because that has been one of the big challenges that we face as an industry. So are you positive on the kind of impact that you think uh, it's going to have? I am, actually. Uh, you know, just to give you an example, if you look at the oil and gas sector in Nigeria, we actually hold, as a country, somewhere about 38% of the reserves of Africa. But we've only been able to attract about 5% of investment in oil and gas which means we're punching way below our weight when it comes to attracting investment. And there's a reason for this, right? Part of it is when people want to invest, they're looking for certain things. If I put my money into a business, am I going to get my returns? What kind of risk am I going to be taking? How difficult is it to actually do business? And so if you focus on the fiscals as one example, what the government has done is to actually say what areas have already been addressed by the Petroleum Industry Act and by other fiscal laws that are in existence and which areas are suffering by not having been previously addressed. And one of those areas is actually what we refer to typically as dry gas or non-associated gas. When you have natural gas occurring in the reservoirs, you know, in the ground, Typically, and very often it occurs together with oil or other liquids like condensate. And so when you produce them together, you're able to sell the oil or the condensate and make enough money to cover for what you're spending on developing the gas. But where you have non-associated gas, and so the gas is occurring alone, you don't have the benefit of the revenue from the condensate or, or the crude oil. And so you need to invest more in order to develop that gas uh, because you don't have that offset. And so one of the things that uh, the presidential directives has done is to enable those who want to develop non-associated gas to get the benefit of tax credits you know, over the first 10 years of that project, uh, after which it then becomes a tax allowance. And they're then able to, through those tax credits, recover uh, you know, the investment that they make within non-associated gas. Because we haven't had this, there are a lot of non-associated gas fields, both onshore and in the shallow water, that have not been developed. And these have just been, you know, fallow for all this while. And hopefully with this incentive, it will unlock the investments within this area. But it's not just that, you know, the, the directives have also, as I said, looked at the contracting life cycle. And this is an interesting part. We have been operating a contracting cycle that is somewhere between four, five, six times 
that of the global standard. Extremely inefficient. It takes too long to get approvals in order to either make your investment or get contracts approved to execute. And so they've looked at a couple of things in trying to unlock this challenge. One of which is to say, how do we simplify the contracting process? So look at the process chain and are there elements that can be removed so that we actually shrink the process? And so bring it down to somewhere within the global standard of about six months. Some countries have done much better and can even approve within three months or less. But you know, we're aiming at six months within these directives and I think that's a good target to have. But aside from just shrinking the process, they've also looked at what threshold, financial thresholds are required in order to re, uh, put in place all of the uh, rigorous approval processes. In other words, rather than almost majority of the contracts requiring to go through that process, they've raised the financial threshold to about uh, 10 million US dollars, which means that only significant, very material contracts have to go through the rigor of that. Others can move much faster. And so th that's also an important element. They've also taken a look at individual contracts and said, rather than limiting them to three-year contracts, which will then get you know, uh, renewed or extended, and you have to come back and restart the approval process again, increase that time from three to five years. And in fact, add on top of that the opportunity to also do a two-year extension on the back of that before you then have to come back and, and restart the tendering and approval process. So all of these together with what's been done around local content, you know, trying to eliminate intermediaries and middlemen and so on, I think goes a long way to uh, open up the Nigerian oil and gas sector for investment. This is why we had to have you on the show. That was a, fun, a fantastic deep dive explaining everything and how this was. We really appreciate that. I want to ask you about gas supply. Um, since the administration came in, they've tried to address, and this, I'm talking about cooking gas now, LPG. Um, looking at the metrics for the, the company, LNG Limited, um, you're aiming to be one of the major suppliers of cooking gas to the country. Uh, you're doing already about 40% of the domestic demand and you're so far the highest single supplier. Now, um, what's being done to improve LPG supply? Because we understand that you know, exports were supposedly stopped in order to redirect them to domestically. So how's the administration supporting the efforts there? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, we have always as a company had the vision to be a globally competitive LNG company that is helping to build a better Nigeria. And so for us, the, the second part around helping to build a better Nigeria is something that we hold very close to our hearts. Part of it is what can we do to improve the life and livelihoods of Nigerians. We produce a number of different products from our plant, right? There's the liquefied natural gas, which is the main product that we export, but there's also the liquefied petroleum gas, which is LPG, and then condensate. Now, LPG is not just one product. It's actually a combination of butane, or C4, and then propane, which is C3. And we produce both. Now, butane is mainly what we use in Nigeria as cooking gas. Propane can be used as cooking gas, but it's also used for other things like transportation. It can be used for power generation. It can be used in industry, petrochemicals, etc. Since 2007, because prior to that we were exporting the LPGs, but in 2007 we started domesticating LPG. And we've been increasing the volumes that we've been domesticating into the Nigerian market since then. But in 2002, we took a decision that we were actually going to domesticate 100% of our production. And so way before the government came to that decision, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had as a company made a decision that we would send 100% of our production into the domestic market. And we have actually succeeded in doing that, at least for butane because there's a market, a huge market for butane. As you said, we've ranged between 30 and 40% of the overall supply into the Nigerian market. Now, propane has been a bit more difficult, not because we're not willing 
to supply it into the domestic market, but because the infrastructure and the facilities to receive that propane is not fully in place. And so we do send as much as we can, but from time to time, we have to actually export some propane. And this is something that we're working with partners in the market to try and put in place the infrastructure that's needed so that we can fulfill our own commitment to domesticate 100%. And that's our aspiration. So we've been there you know, at 100% since 2022, actually. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, I, did, I have to quickly ask you the, about LNG uh, Train uh, 7. Yeah. Hmm? I have to quickly ask you about LNG Train yeah. 7 and your plans. I think you say it's about 60% um, completed. And as far as the um, supply per annum, going from about 22 metric tons to about 30, um, how are things moving along there with respect to Train 7? We're making good progress on Train 7. Um, as you said, you know, we're more than halfway there in terms of the whole uh, engineering, procurement and, and construction of the project. Uh, it's been safe construction, uh, you know, and, and the progress has been such that we now, you know, when you go to site, you actually see most of the big and heavy structures already in place. What we're now focusing on is making sure that when the midstream project is in place, that the gas supply is also there. One of the presidential directives that I spoke about earlier is actually one of the things that's going to help us to unlock the gas supply into train seven as well. Okay, and um, I wanted to ask about the dividends that um, LNG has been paying to, you know, to the NPCL. It hit an eight-year high in 2022. I mean, 2023 is already over. Um, I think it's it, okay. So here's our here's the amount there. So 1.3 billion from 2014 all the way through to uh, 1.18 billion in 2022. Any idea what that figure could be like in uh, 2023? Because LNG has been a very important foreign exchange source uh, for the nation. Yeah, so our contribution to Nigeria is not just dividends, uh, it's, it's taxes. Uh, so as you know, we're a company incorporated under CETA and so we pay our 30% CETA, we pay the education tax and all of that. Um, and, and so those are very significant. There have been times when we've been listed as the leading taxpayer in the country. Um, we also, of course, pay dividends to our shareholders. And, and that continues you know, from year to year. Now, as you well know, dividends fluctuate from year to year, depending on our profitability and our, you know, our bottom line. Uh, I won't go into the numbers, but what I can tell you is that um, 2022 was a bumper year for the industry. Uh, very unfortunate that that was caused by the Russia-Ukraine war, but when that war occurred, what then happened was that the demand for uh, LNG and natural gas around the world just shot up. Prices went through you know, the sky. And as a result, you know, it, we, we got significant uh, revenue as a company and that translated into the bottom line. Now, subsequent years like 2023, you know, prices have become weaker uh, and we have faced challenges as well with, with uh, gas supply and volumes. And so those are likely to impact our taxes and our dividends as well. Uh, Mr. Mshavila, you are a wealth of knowledge on the uh, oil and gas sector. We have to have you back uh, to discuss so much more. We've run out of time, had so many questions, but thank you for talking to us about the executive orders and how that is going to help the value chain uh, in Nigeria. We appreciate your time. The MD CEO of Nigeria, LNG Limited. Uh